Hello, everyone. I'm Leandro Yanazzi, professor in education design at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And it's a great pleasure uh, to participate in this second uh, International Digital Citizenship Festival in the Digital Accessibility section. It's also a great pleasure to be able to speak with Professor Sean Bracken of the University of Worcester, UK. Professor Sean is a world reference in research on technology and accessibility, universal design for learning, inclusion uh, and intercultural education, and has a strong connection with Brazilian and international research all over the world. He's also the founder and coordinator of INCLUDE, the International Collaboratory for Leadership in Universally Designed Education, which is uh, in an international network for discussion and support for universal design for learning. Thank you so much, Professor Sean, for participating in this conversation about digital accessibility. And Professor Sean, the, uh, the first question, a little more personal, I think, I recognize and admire uh, your efforts to connect with researchers uh, from all over the world. world. Uh, where does this motivation uh, for connection and inclusion come from? That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think it begins from having maybe an untraditional uh, path in education myself. I became an elementary school teacher or primary school teacher in Samoa, actually, in the Pacific Islands. And uh, when I was there, I recognized maybe how little I knew as a teacher in a different cultural context. And that spurred my uh, determination to know more about how people learn in different cultural contexts and how culture and indeed language play a significant part in that learning. So I think that's what's motivated me. Um, I followed up that uh, educational experience in teaching English as an additional language in New York almost 30 years ago. And I, I uh, worked in New York for five years, again, as an elementary school teacher. And um, that's where I trained actually to be, um, to be a teacher and where I got my accreditation. So I think that I was working with a diversity of learners there who came from a, a diversity of cultural and linguistic backgrounds. And so that international perspective, again, was a very strong feature of uh, my own learning and my learning from others, indeed, in regards to their cultural contexts and their linguistic contexts. In 2018, I had the very good fortune to um, have the opportunity through um, FAPESB and through um, the British Academy to travel to Brazil and to work with colleagues there to have a focus on inclusive practice. So at this time, I was a lecturer at the University of, of Worcester, and I had again been uh, provided with the opportunity by the University of, of Worcester to travel to Brazil and to make links with colleagues there. And I think, again, I could see some strong similarities in relation to how we approached aspects of inclusive practice, but also the fact that we could learn significantly from one another in that international and transnational domain. So I think it's it's important for us to, to create those spaces for research, for learning, and for collaboration um, in that international sphere. And it's amazing because uh, uh, mainly, I think we, we see the first world uh, countries <laughs> as uh, the helpers, but in, in the collaboration logic, we are uh, connecting to help each other, to learn with each other. That's a really important point. And in fact, I learned a lot from my uh, experiences internationally and particularly thinking about my last visit to Brazil, which occurred just before the pandemic and uh, gaining an insight into the experiences of, uh, of students who were blind and in, indeed some students who were deaf blind and recognizing that they could play um, a really active role within the maintained school systems. That was a revelation to me and something that we can learn from here 
in the United Kingdom and perhaps even more so in the global north. The practices that all teachers had to learn Brazilian sign language, for example, and that uh, there was really significant strides towards developing inclusive practices uh, within Brazil, I think. So again, it's a reciprocal learning process. I don't think it's one that is unidirectional at all. There's a lot to be learned, I think, in those transnational engagements. Thank you so much for this uh, 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 vision more abroad about uh, 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 collaborative practices. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, getting into the uh, main subject, uh, what is a uh, universal design design for learning and how it's applied in classroom prats? Yeah, I think um, what appeals to me significantly about universal design for learning is that it primarily focuses upon anticipatory design. So it's the first time that I've encountered a framework that really enables um, educational designers or, or uh, technology designers to think about what's called uh, user X, so the end user. So thinking about the diversity of our students, thinking about the diversity of technological users and the, the, the vast diversities, whether those may be as I had identified earlier on in relation to culture, in relation to language, or indeed in relation to physical or cognitive disabilities. So that anticipation of difference enables designers to think about how best to um, create systems and processes in education and to design um, technological responses, uh, which will take into consideration in terms of universal design for learning, the three overarching dimensions. Firstly, uh, multiple means of engagement. So that attribute of engagement is um, founded upon what are the affective, what's the affective dimension to the learning? How can we include the um, enthusiasm of the learner in relation to how we create tools learning tools, technological learning tools, or how we create uh, courses in order to facilitate the interests and the capabilities of uh, the particular uh, users or learners with whom we're engaged. So the second attribute of universal design for learning is thinking about multiple means of representation. So how can we use the technological devices and options and apps um, to facilitate that learning. And I know Leandro in particular, you're very much interested in gamification and that the, the potential for the individual to enter into a game, to represent themselves differently in terms of the character, for example, and to overcome challenges that they may, may face. And I think that there's real potential for the application of universal design for learning to uh, particular approaches that we might take, such as gamification in technologies. And then ultimately, um, UDL also speaks to uh, multiple means of action and expression. So that's how do we go about uh, expressing ourselves, creating actions. And in formal education, I suppose that's most closely aligned to the concept of assessments. So how do we create assessments that are going to enable learners to uh, provide evidence that they have attained their learning outcome in multiple ways? So not just assuming that learners are going to, for example, write an essay in the humanities, but that they can engage in activities such as this. You and I talking about uh, the nature of learning at an incredible distance, but we are connected in, in a really interesting way. So I think um, technologies provide the potential for, uh, for learners to really evidence uh, dyma dynamic attributes of what they can do, how they can contribute to knowledge, how, we ca how can we engage in research, and how can we use the technologies to facilitate that. I think 
uh, UDL really provides that cohesive uh, conceptual framework which will enable us to conjoin those elements of technology and learning together in a really meaningful way. Fantastic, Professor. Thank you so much for bringing us these three dim dimensions of UDL. So important to us as an educator and as a society to to uh, uh, to get these uh, uh, three uh, dimensions. Thanks so much. But uh, now, in the words of the uh, this uh, networks creator and articulator that which is include, uh, what, what is include and what it's the, the its contribution to uh, the dissemination of the UDL at the global level. Great, thank you for that uh, question, Leandro. Well, include is it's the manifestation of a shared idea, I think, in the first instance, a shared vision. And that vision uh, was co-developed, I think, between myself initially and um, Associate Professor Richard Jackson from Boston College um, in Massachusetts in the United States. And that came about as a result of conversations that we'd had um, after the publication of a book um, called Transforming Higher Education Through Universal Design for Learning, an International Perspective. But it was a focus on that latter part, on the international perspective, that we really thought that there was a, a lacuna, that there was a gap in that particular area, and that there was a necessity to somehow join networks of colleagues together internationally so that we could foster the ideas around universal design for learning and uh, create um, the uh, conditions that would be required for uh, collaboration, transnational collaboration, research, learning, and insights from uh, right across the world, because it's a, it's a social justice imperative in relation to our capacity to be able to enable learning, particularly from those uh, learners who may have been traditionally marginalized. So include, and it is a wonderful brand I have to, uh, I have to share, which yes. is the, the International Collaboratory for Leadership in Universally Designed Education. We started some three years ago, and we're very much uh, informed and guided by a research informed um, and action oriented values. So we have a very strong value base and I would encourage um, the listeners to perhaps have a look at our website and to read through those values which underpin um, our shared practices. We're oriented by a shared um, steering group and increasingly uh, we see the importance uh, within that uh, steering group of the learner voice. Because I think initially there was uh, the design of universal design for learning, which took place in the late 1980s and early 1990s in uh, Massachusetts, was oriented perhaps a little bit towards um, elementary or primary school uh, teaching but include also so the benefits and potential for focusing upon higher education. And within that higher education, I think when we think about user X or when we think about the learners, um, their cognitive capabilities are significantly greater than perhaps, well, they're different. I don't want to say they're greater, but they're very different than perhaps the, the cognitive uh, uh, interactions and capabilities with which younger children may view learning. So there's a necessity to incorporate learner voice, to engage much more in a dialogue around the nature of learning and about the design of learning, and um, in association with that, the nature of technological tools and the design of technological tools and the accessibility of uh, technological tools more generally. So that's been, um, a little bit of the history. We've been in existence for two years at this stage, and I think we've got a very strong future because there is there is a very great hunger, I think, for that element of collaboration, for learning from one another, and to create kind of shared opportunities for learning. I have to share in that latter regard, 
um, that my colleague um, Betsy Dalton, um, who's also from uh, currently working at the University at Boston College, has done significant work in relation to providing um, enabling include to provide a platform for colleagues from right across the world to share their insights about how they're applying UDL strategies, particularly in higher education to facilitate accessibility. And that has included a significant focus on attributes of technological uh, accessibility, including obviously from your own university, Leandro. That's right. But I, I, uh, I have to say for myself that it's amazing how much information uh, the website or uh, include website has uh, about this uh, international experience ab about applying UDL. And it's amazing because we can learn a lot and we can take these ideas, uh, adapt in, in our context and also uh, share again. Uh, the, apply, uh, the application so it's a very collaboratory as uh, it said in the name and uh, it's very 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 rich uh, rich our uh, practice thank you so much for for this platform and thank you so much for connecting people all over the world that's uh, amazing I think ju just maybe to follow up on that leandro because it's it's an important point that you've just made about the website and about how it provides a a platform for people to engage with one another and to share those elements of practice. And I think the the, the website is a manifestation of perhaps what follows, uh, what takes place behind the scenes. And that is that capacity for colleagues such as you and I to, to engage and to share ideas and to swap ideas. And I think one of the significant uh, um, pieces of evidence in relation to that was the hosting of a learner voice conference at the University of Ebenzora last March. And that really astounded me in terms of providing, uh, enabling the power of the learner voice um, uh, to, to, come to, the, to come to the fruition and to provide, I suppose, a platform as I identified in Morocco, for example, uh, where maybe traditionally the learners had not played a significant part in, in relation to informing the design of their own uh, learning opportunities. But it very much has, I think, since the, since the development of Include. And it does have that potential to, to transform, to be transformative in, in regards to international education. So it, it is a, it's a very welcome development. But it, it's not so much a personal one I have to share as one that takes place within a shared community and across a collaboratory. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much for uh, um, to, to to provide this uh, this environment, this digital environment, to uh, so we can share uh, our experience and our uh, our fights, our uh, troubles also. Uh, professor, the world is uh, the world is experiencing the pandemic, the COVID pand uh, pandemic, and we suddenly had to adapt to homeschooling and this uh, intense use of digital technologies in education. How can UDL be used in uh, with digital uh, technologies? I think um, it has incredible potential. Um, I think I have to share in the first instance, though, that we are all. At, at a loss in terms of maybe those more social and personal interactions that we have on a daily basis. So I'm not sure that ultimately uh, technology can really bridge that human gap. However, um, the uh, I suppose the alternative scenario is to be solo in one's room or to be solo in one's house so that the affordances of technology really do provide enormous capabilities for us to interact at a distance and to, to share knowledge and to create knowledge um, and to facilitate learning that is quite different. I think we're at our very early stages, 12, 18 months onwards from the significant shift that we've taken that has taken place to online learning. Um, but I think the more recent developments in regards to COVID have illustrated that we cannot go, go back to normal 
um, I think the terrain has changed, our landscape has changed significantly. We can no longer ignore the potential power that learning technologies have to facilitate learning at a distance. And when I say at a distance, I mean distance in space and distance in time so that it can facilitate learning when and where learners wish to access that learning. I think that's what's the most powerful attribute of, of what we can take away from the uh, significant shift to online learning. However, I think we have to be very mindful of two overarching um, modes of reflection that we have to take into account uh, in these times. And I have to thank my colleague, Aisha Abdul Sattar from UNISA in South Africa, who's uh, helped me articulate and sharpen my understanding around these two areas. And the first is um, the element of digital literacy. So to what extent do people uh, have the capability to actively engage and inform the nature of their learning and to uh, to be able to fashion that learning according to their own interests and desires. And um, that notion of digital literacy also being part of digital citizenship. So to what extent do, can individuals contribute to a wider well-being uh, of community with the use of digital uh, tools and, and uh, technologies. But there's also the element of, so you have literacy, but there's also the element of, of poverty and recognizing that sometimes we make the assumptions that everybody has access to, to the tools for learning, the technological tools for learning and the technological tools for engagement with wider society. That's not the case. There's a vast uh, imbalance, I think, in relation to access to the resources. And I think that's that has become absolutely highlighted by the educational experiences um, from Brazil to the United Kingdom, to South Africa, to the United States. And I think it's very much highlighted the necessity for us to address those two key areas of digital literacy and digital poverty. If we want to create a meaningful sense of digital citizenship. Wow, that's a, a, a very challenge uh, uh, thought you try uh, you bring to us, and it's very important to think about how to be a, a, to to uh, be a citizen uh, uh, if we don't have access, if we don't have if we have this gap, uh, this technology gap in literacy and in the uh, in the material access also to the technology thanks so much professor absolutely uh, leandro and i think this to some extent we, how we can uh, how we can discover the the nature of that digital literacy and digital poverty in regards to our own experiences as uh, educators is to conduct either large scale or small scale research within our settings and perhaps even encourage that that element uh, transnationally as well to what extent are is digital citizenship being facilitated transnationally how are people using the technologies and the affordances of technologies transnationally um, in different contexts and I think we you know I'm very very much aware of having visited uh, some colleagues, in, in uh, Sao Paulo, um, and particularly at the University of uh, Sao Catano do Sul, and how they were reflecting on uh, particular cohorts of learners, um, uh, learners who lived in the favelas, for example, and thinking about ac accessibility and, and the technology, technological accessibility and literacy that perhaps uh, pertained to communities within uh, within those situations. So I think, and recognizing the, 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 the material imbalances in relation to technology. So I think these are the things that when we talk about uh, universal design, um, that we have to grapple with those notions as, as we're reflecting on user X, as we're reflecting on the end users. So thank you yes. for, for prompting that discussion. And we have also the challenge of the lack of digital literacy of the 
professor, the teacher. <laughs> it's a very indeed. <laughs> indeed. And I think that that illustrates the necessity for the types of professional development that include is providing actually. And um, the necessity, I think, for universities to invest in significantly in that domain, because as you have illustrated, you know, COVID has led us to a situation where the where there is the absolutely fundamental um, necessity for educators to have particular at levels of, of literacy themselves in order to engage meaningfully with learners in our day and age and faced with the challenges with which we have been faced. Yeah, good point. That's right. Uh, we are talking about citizenship uh, through technology, and this event is about uh, digital citizenship. Uh, how do you think the digital technologies can help or uh, hinder uh, the inclusion of people with disabilities in, in, act in active participation and exercising their citizenship? I think, again, it comes back to design and how we enable design so that universally, so that learners with disabilities um, can engage as productively and meaningfully and fully as, as every other citizen. And I think that's a basic human right. I think uh, uh, some weeks ago I was reading an article in the, uh, might have been the Times Higher Education, where an educator had shared um, that he, in his experiences as a disabled uh, learner, that um, that some momentum had been lost since um, the signing of the UN Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I think we need to get come back to that and to and to have a re-energized sense of urgency in relation to uh, digital citizenship belonging to everybody and thinking about perhaps as I had mentioned earlier, more marginalized learners and members of our communities. And when I say they're marginalized, I, I mean that the, to some extent they're pushed to the margins, um, that it's perhaps the people who have access to the technologies who, who are perceived as normal, um, although there is no normal. And, and I think the, the more that we recognize that and the more that we incorporate in terms of our planning and in terms of our design and in terms of our thinking about digital uh, citizenship, that it includes everybody. Um, so that is in the same way that a wheelchair user has the right to access a library, um, that we could think of people with disabilities, whether, the, whether they're cognitive uh, disabilities or physical disabilities, that they can access um, the learning and access uh, their contributions more widely to society through the use of technologies. And I think, I think technologies provide significant or have the potential to provide significant um, uh, affordances in that regard, that there's real, very strong potential for, I think, uh, digital technologies to, to enable access to, to wider contributions to community and to education. Professor, thank you so much for our, your considerations and uh, our, our challenge you put for us in this conversation. I'm very honored to be part of your network, <laughs> to be part of our contacts and uh, to learn so much with uh, for, from your research and from your life trajectory uh, it's a uh, it's a very uh, it's a pleasure to 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 talk to you always to learn with you to uh, to exchange ideas to exchange experience so much uh, 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 it's uh, it's always so rich to to talk to you thank you so much professor Le Leandro, I have to thank you for the opportunity and um, for the, again, for the opportunity for me to learn and uh, for your contributions to, to include and for taking the initiative, I think, to, to spread the good word of include and inclusion. Um, and I, indeed, I would invite any of the colleagues who are listening here today to, to reach out and to join us and to become part of that uh, collaboratory and the potential to 
to really transform our world and how we think about our world through accessible technologies so that it becomes a, a, a better place for all of us. And I think that's what motivates us all. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. My pleasure.